Good morning, all you early birds. Thank you very much uh, for coming to this Playbook Breakfast. For all those New Yorkers who are watching on the live stream, I want you to know that the mayor was early. Uh, uh, we're honored to have uh, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio with us today. He'll be out in a moment. Uh, before we kick off the program, I'd like to thank the Bank of America for supporting the Playbook series. Uh, they've been such awesome partners. We had a great event this weekend in Little Rock. Alumni of the Clinton administration celebrating the 10th anniversary of the William J. Clinton Presidential Library. And as you probably saw online, the president himself stopped by for a special appearance. So we appreciate Bank of America for this ongoing partnership, these great conversations about the issues that matter most in Washington. And now we welcome Mayor de Blasio. <laughs> so Mayor, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much right here. All right. You shuttled down on your plane. Yes, sir. Uh, Frank Luntz, Loretta Lynch. is an all-star plane. <laughs> <laughs> How do people treat you on the shuttle? I think people on the shuttle are pretty like in their zone of whatever they're working on. So they get the polite nod and not a lot else. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you've been at this job since January. What's the part of the job that is the coolest perk you didn't know about? Something that you thought, this job is awesome. You can get into restaurants really easily. <laughs> Someone, someone the other day said they could get uh, a reservation at Rayo's, which is kind of a New York legend that no one can get into. And I thought, oh my God, they got a reservation at Rayo's. I got to go. I, gotta, I thought, wait a minute, I probably can get into Rayo's now. <laughs> it took me a mo moment of recognition there. Okay. And what part of the job really blows? Like something that's even <laughs> worse than you thought? I think that the phenomenon of the cell phone camera, which now turns into selfies or ussies, if it's a group situation, and people want them a lot. And then the problem is they forget to put in their code, and so you get this long sort of operatic dynamic of people trying to get their phone ready so they can get the selfie and all. That I did not expect. It's a warm, loving thing on one level, but that I did not expect. Uh, it's uh, overdone. So at Portico and Playbook, we always start with the news uh, this morning, our sister organization, uh, Capital New York, reporting that the city has raised $10 million toward hosting the 2016 Democratic Convention, and uh, you've set a goal of $100 million. You have some tough competition, especially Philly, Columbus. What's the outlook for New York, and specifically your Brooklyn, getting the 2016 Democratic Convention? We feel very good about it. We have one of the newest and best arenas in the country in the Barclays Center. We have the finest security capacity anywhere in the country. We have great logistical capacity. We've proven before that we can put on a great convention bluntly for either party. Um, we're going to raise at least $100 million for our host committee. I've personally uh, pledged that. $10 million already committed. Great folks involved from business, labor, all over our city. So I think what is going to be the winning hand here is that we have a very strong range of uh, capacity that we bring to this and the resources, obviously, that we, I, I don't think a lot of people doubt uh, the willingness and the ability of New York City to put together the resources that are needed for the convention. And sadly, uh, campaigns are more expensive than ever. Uh, well, New York is more expensive than anything else. Yeah, but I'm saying the overall campaign context, as you've documented, is more, like, gallops forward each year in terms of expense. So for the Democratic Party to know the thing they will not have to worry about is the cost of the convention, at least from the host committee side, uh, I think is a great step forward. Now, uh, Sally Goldenberg on Capitol New York this morning uh, has a statement from you where you talk about the broad cross-section of New Yorkers who are for it. Why do people want it? In New York, it's not as big a deal as it would be in Philly or Columbus. Well, in Brooklyn, it is. In Brooklyn, it is. And this is part of what I think is so powerful about this moment. Look, we're a five-borough city that has been often portrayed as a one-borough city, a Manhattan-based city. But really, the five boroughs are flowering now, economically, culturally, in every way. And, and having the convention in Brooklyn would epitomize that growth, that fullness of our city. And look, there, Brooklyn's gone through a renaissance, which I think speaks to a lot about where this country can and should go. Brooklyn has always been a place for everyone. It's been a place that has given anyone who had the, the talent, the drive, the creativity, the entrepreneurship, an opportunity and so the success of that opportunity culture really is a powerful message, I think, for Democrats. So being in Brooklyn is something fresh and different. 
Uh, and that gives an excitement, of course, in Brooklyn, and I think throughout the outer boroughs, that their moment has arrived, to say the least. A penultimate one on this. How do you overcome the natural advantages that Columbus, Philly have as swing states, uh, uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania as swing states? Um, I used to do political work before I ran for office. And I think one of the things we find is that there are assumptions that never necessarily got proven, one of them being you know, uh, a convention in a certain state affects the outcome of the election. By the way, another one that we used to believe was the vice presidential uh, choice guaranteed that the ticket would win the state that the vice president came from. I mean, there's a lot of things we all came up with that were conventional wisdom. I think in today's dynamic, a well-organized convention allows the party to get its message out is what matters. It really has very little bearing on what happens in that state. You live, last question on this, you live in a city where if you sleep in, it's on the front page of the paper. The other day, the New York Post had you with a nightcap on how do you avoid having the convention become about you and having a story every time some small business owner or some church is inconvenienced by the security perimeter? I think uh, you're right that that certain part of the media might look at things that way, but the larger discourse, and I think it gets to what we're going to talk about in a moment as well, the larger discourse where people actually uh, live where they think has nothing to do with those little momentary things. I think from the point of view of the city as a whole, the convention would be a great boost to our economy and would obviously be another showcase for what New York City has to offer to the world. And that's where there's a lot of natural excitement and a lot of people are excited about 2016 and what it's going to mean for this country. So yeah, sure there'll be some stray stories uh, about someone who has a complaint. There'll also be a lot of stories about the good the convention is doing. In the end, the essence is what matters, not the tabloid headlines. Uh, after the fantastic day for Democrats the other day, hmm. uh, you had an op-ed in the Huffington Post with the headline, don't soul search, stiffen your backbone. And your big message is that the key to victory for Democrats is economic populism. That's right. Look. What was so shockingly absent in this election, in the discussion, in the national discussion, was where are we going economically and what are we doing about what has become a massive opportunity gap in this country. The uh, income inequality crisis is, I believe, fundamentally the defining issue of our times. Uh, I think I have some ability to speak to this from my own experience last year. Uh, literally, the theme of my campaign was that New York City was experiencing a tale of two cities, that the income inequality gap and the other gaps in equality had grown so intense that it had fundamentally set back the lives of so many of our people. And that's what uh, people were experiencing, that's what they understood, that's what they gravitated towards. So an example from my own experience, long before I had any traction, when I was fourth and fifth in the polls and I had very little in the way of resources, we started gathering support in ways we didn't even at first understand. And it came clear to me over time that the idea of addressing the issue forthrightly aggressively, honestly, authentically, uh, led a lot of voters, citizens, to seek out uh, whoever was talking about the real issues of their lives. And I offered bold solutions. I offered the, the notion of taxing the wealthy so we could have pre-K. I offered the notion of greatly reducing uh, the unfair stops that were plaguing the relationship between police and community, a stop and frisk program. Um, I talked about what we had to do to build affordable housing, even if it meant demanding more of landlords. And so what happened over time was people, the electorate gravitated to something tangible and meaningful. Compare that to, sadly, the experience we just had. How many of the campaigns focused on income inequality? How many said that we're living in an unacceptable paradigm that must shift? Well, very, very few. Some of the ones that did, as I note in the op-ed, actually prevailed but very few overall. What happened, Democrats stayed home, uninspired, unmoved, a lot of swing voters, a lot of independent voters looking for something tangible that was actually about their lives, couldn't find it, either stayed home or went to the Republicans. I think when you look at the dynamic, here's, here's another way of saying it, in America today, there are people talking powerfully about income inequality. Janet Yellen's doing it, Lloyd Blankfein's doing it, Steve Ratner the other day, in the New York Times uh, op-ed page. Uh, folks from the finance industry, folks from, in Janet Yellen's case, the Federal Reserve are talking about, but where are the Democrats talking about the issue that quintessentially defines what the Democratic Party should be about? You talk to them all the time, you come out of that world, why are they so gun-shy? I think they're scared of powerful interests. I think they okay. are. 
sorry, news, news flash. I, no, I do. I think there is because, again, look at how we started the discussion, the cost of campaigns. Uh, when you started out, when I started out, look at, look at what the cost of a campaign was there versus now. Okay. Right there, just one quick point, right there. If, if the cost of campaigns has, determined, has created a dynamic where people are so fundraising focused that that almost becomes this first question in every campaign, then alienating those with resources becomes an obvious fear. And that alone constrains the ability of too many Democrats, at least in their mind, to speak to the issues. And I think they're also not hearing the fact that if you don't speak to these issues, you're literally unelectable. A question I got uh, through email from one of your fellow Democrats was, do most voters see themselves as victims? I think most voters see themselves right now as either um, stuck or falling backwards economically. In that way, I would say yes. If you're talking about economics, I'd say yes. That they feel the, um, the American dream, I don't want to be hackneyed, but I think it's true, the American dream has ceased to function for a lot of families, a huge number of families, and that core part of the American dream, the next generation would do better, is essentially on hold at best. In that milieu, all the more reason for Democrats to speak sharply to the dynamic. Uh, uh, at uh, our colleagues at Capitol New York, had, and I see Catherine Lear uh, here in the audience, uh, uh, we had a story, uh, Sally Goldenberg also wrote, saying de Blasio advises red state Dems who weren't asking. And some of them uh, pushed back at it, and uh, someone who worked on Senator Pryor's campaign said that in fact he did talk about protecting Social Security and Medicare benefits. And the feedback that I've gotten is easy for you to say in New York, harder to do in a purple or red state. Okay, a couple points. One, I, agree, I understand that immediately, and there's some truth in that. but. When I ran for mayor, the city I represented had a Republican mayor for 20 years. Even if Bloomberg went through his different permutations, he ran originally as a Republican. We certainly had not had a Democratic mayor for 20 years, point one, point two. Uh, I myself, when I started out, was hesitant about the ramifications of being so blunt. So I can understand anyone who says, well, wait a minute, if you talk about taxing the wealthy, if you talk about um, doing things that will challenge the real estate industry, whatever it may be, uh, there'll be pushback, you won't have the resources, you know, people will, will, will stereotype you. I understand anyone who has those fears, I had them myself, but the realization I came to was from literally talking to people, that if you, again, if you don't speak to those issues, you will be uh, unable to break through. And so then the question is, okay, if you say, well, some of those states, let's say they're more conservative, let's say there might be more resistance. The problem I have is the, the safe playbook, which a lot of these Democrats in theory uh, utilize, stay away from uh, health care reform, stay away from the president, uh, don't talk about income inequality, don't challenge the wealthy. Well, that playbook, as you saw, led to pretty devastating results. A lot of the races that we all watching the situation thought would be close, close, turned out not to be close at all. So we don't even have a control model in one of those states of a Democrat that said, damn the torpedoes, I'm gonna talk about the fact that people are struggling economically and the sharp, bold things we have to do about it. We don't have one to point up as an example who tried it and lost. Saying you wanna protect Medicare and Social Security is hardly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about changing some of the fundamental economic realities. Since no one tried it, I can't tell you how it would have worked. I can tell you in some of the same states the minimum wage referendum passed in some of those very same states, right. and I think that's telling. Last one on this, Sally writes, several Washington-based consultants told Capitol that de Blasio's op-ed was received with a collective eye roll by Democrats in those states. How do you make this sale, the point that you're making here, to other Democrats for 2016? Point one, the results speak for themselves. Uh, folks didn't try this message, lost sadly overwhelmingly the safe messages didn't work. Point two, some of the folks out there who did stick to their guns, and I used in uh, the op-ed examples of candidates in states that had often gone Republican in recent years, who stuck to their guns and fighting on the question of income inequality or willing to challenge Wall Street, you name it. Uh, they prevailed, and it's a very clear pattern, they prevailed in states that had gone the other way as recently as two years ago, four years ago, because they were consistent on that issue. So it was not just that they spoke to income inequality and talked about serious solutions. They were willing to take on powerful interests. They were authentic. They were consistent. 
They were speaking to the reality of today's world post-Great Recession in a meaningful way. So my argument is, I get the eye roll, that's easy. Again, I used to be a consultant of a sort myself. The problem is it, it misses the core point that the, uh, the moderate approach, the, the approach of avoiding the issue, has been, it's actually the way around, has been proven to fail so consistently. Why on earth would you not try a bolder approach? Okay. What are the ramifications of this argument for 2016? That the Democratic Party has to look in the mirror and bluntly realize that if we repeat 2014, we're clearly doomed. Uh, we cannot win an election if our own people are not motivated. And I think um, a subset point, and again, I understood this from my own experience last year. A lot of us, I think, coming up thought that elections were first and foremost about persuasion of an electorate already motivated to vote. I think that was a template we learned. I think what happened along the way, and I imagine a lot of people in this room came to the conclusion in their own ways, is the paradigm shifted so profoundly because the option of not voting became more and more real. And now it has become uh, you know, a, a prairie rebellion, if you will. People are not voting in droves. Uh, they are choosing not to participate for lack of, not interest, that would be the wrong way of saying it, for lack of motivation, for lack of a belief that anyone was actually representing their interests. The problem in that equation is there's been a greater propensity of Democrats to feel left out, misunderstood, misheard, everyday Democrats, and we saw that in great evidence in this election. If Democrats look at that and say, okay, our own people are not even hearing a message from us, our own people are not even motivated to vote, let alone swing voters, it suggests that you can't repeat this pattern. It suggests that the times that you saw success, and you can see some of this in 2008, some of this in 2012, is when there was closer adherence to talking about people's economic lives and talking about a, a sharp willingness to take on the status quo. It's a status quo, and I, another way of saying it simply is it's a status quo that's just not working for most Americans. And so if Democrats are unafraid to say that, are afraid to say it out loud, they can't prevail, just because right away they won't motivate their own people. Now, if they say it out loud, if they talk about income inequality, if they talk about actually changing course, they recapture some of the momentum that Democrats had for many decades as being an easily identifiable party on the side of middle class people and working class people and willing to make waves for change. That motivates turnout, interest, energy. That's what we need in 2016. And you see a global element to this movement politics. Yes, because the economic crisis is the same in so many of the industrialized countries. I mean, you look, when you look around the world, these same fights are playing out. I had the honor of being invited to um, Great Britain to address the Labor Party convention a few weeks back. And the same exact issues are playing out there, growing income inequality, a sense of middle class people being stuck and their children not having the same opportunity. I looked at Ed Miliband's platform. I, I did not know it before I studied it in preparation for my speech. It was almost a, a replica of what we had run on the year before. He wasn't copying us. We right. all came to the same conclusions. A tale of two worlds. A tale of two worlds. So, but, it's, but what's happening all over is the absence of, if progressive parties are unwilling to address these issues head on, what happens? Votes gravitate to conservative populists. Votes, voters stay home. That's what we're seeing all over the world. In 2000, you managed uh, First Lady Hillary Clinton's uh, first campaign for Senate in New York. When you look at the 2016 Democratic field, is there room to the left of Secretary Clinton? I think there is a lot of room for a Democrat to speak to these issues. I think it could well be Secretary Clinton. But one way or another, the Democrats have to speak to these issues. Do you, what is your level of confidence that she will occupy that space? I'm hopeful. I, look, I think she should. I think it's necessary. Um, I think a lot about her history and origins suggests it's natural for her. I, if you go back to the work she did originally, it gets to these same issues, what she did with the Children's Defense Fund, what she did on family and medical leave, what she did on healthcare reform, and we all remember 1993, where it was a huge and risky thing to take on the issue that really got to the core economic reality of our people. So I think there's a pretty substantial body of evidence. 
Uh, and I think what I saw when I was, uh, I had the honor of helping her out in 08 in every way I could, and I was out in Ohio in uh, March of 08, and I think she was speaking to these core economic issues very powerfully. Last one on this, why hasn't she been in that space, or why hasn't she been identified with that space, or why hasn't she been emphasizing those issues? Of course you have to ask her, but I would say that there has been an evolution over these last years since the economic crisis. And I think this is, this is sort of the issue that goes under-discussed. The economic crisis changed our politics. But because we've only really talked about it in the context of the 2012 presidential election, I mean, it was happening as the 2008 election happened, so we talked about it in the context of the 2012 election, it got minimized down to two candidates as opposed to a bigger analysis of what happened. I think our politics changed not quite as much as the politics of the nation changed in 1932 with the Great uh, Depression, but they changed. Uh, during a lot of that time, Secretary Clinton was Secretary Clinton, obviously not in the political environment. So I don't think we've had an opportunity to hear her in this new reality. Have but you talked to her about this? Not in any detail, but the point to Will me, you? I would be honored to. I'd be honored to talk to any and all Democrats around the country on this point, because I think it's where we have to go. But, but the point I was going to say is, when you have that big a shock to the system, the foreclosures, uh, the sense that came from real experience of the kind of freezing of the middle class, and obviously the, the reality of declining real wages. Um, and the income inequality crisis gets that sharp, but it doesn't spark a national discussion. Because really, if I said to you, okay, show me where that nexus of the income inequality debate is in our national discussion. Where was it in the 2014 election or even the 2012 election, again, aside from the two presidential candidates? Where is it in the piece of legislation that's being, well, we're talking about Keystone, or we're talking about uh, nominees for different offices, or we're talking about immigration reform, all very important issues. Where's the income inequality debate in this country? Since it's non-existent, it's one hand clapping, meaning the side that loses, both morally and politically, when we're not talking about income inequality, is the Democrats. As you say, you saw Secretary Clinton's 2008 campaign up close. What needs to be different about a new Clinton campaign? Look, I, I, I don't want to talk about someone who is not a declared candidate. I try to be very careful about that in general. So let me just speak generically, not about any one candidate. In the off chance that Secretary Clinton should run. There you go. What, what should the Democrat do? The Democrat should speak to income inequality. The Democrat should be willing to challenge the status quo, should be willing to challenge wealthy and powerful interests, and should marry that with a grassroots organizing strategy that... Um, epitomizes the message. And this is something, again, we learned. I think it's an important point. Uh, we learned this last year. Of course, again, with ever more expensive campaigns, what does that mean? More media-centric campaigns. Those vastly expensive campaigns are not for more field troops, for more canvassers. We all know this. It's for more airtime. That works on one level. It fails on another level because TV ads can't motivate people to vote. They may be good at getting people to stay home, which I think the conservatives have been very good at uh, recognizing. But motivating people to vote is a much more local and grassroots endeavor. So I think it's one, the message, most importantly, the message, the ideas. Two, taking that message truly to the grassroots on a consistent basis. Two questions about politics and then a question about parenthood. What do you think of Elizabeth Warren? I think she's saying some very important things. I think it's, she's one of the really indispensable voices in our national debate. Uh, do you think she would be a good presidential candidate? Again, I don't want to conjecture about candidates because what I have you, no indication she's interested in that job. What do you think of Rand Paul? I think Rand Paul, uh, although I could not disagree with him more on a host of issues, uh, I do think he evinces a certain authenticity uh, that any good Democrat should worry about. I thought when, for example, speaking up on the drone issue, regardless of what you think about what he said, there was a, a willingness to risk there, and it, and it seemed to connect to an actual, real ideology. What Republican do you fear? What Republican would be a tough match for the Democratic nominee? If you accept the theory that our politics changed because of the Great Recession, and if you accept the theory that there is a deep yearning for authenticity, uh, in a way really more than we've seen, I think, previously, 
then it is the Republican who is most believable in and of themselves and who could to in any way, shape, or form speak to this economic reality. In other words, a Mitt Romney was exactly what the doctor did not order, right? Because you was not believable. He had been the guy who created well, the mass. Well, for you, it's exactly what the doctor did order. Well, exactly. But I'm saying, if, <laughs> if we're talking uh, candidate analysis, right. the guy who had created the Massachusetts healthcare model and then tried to deny his own involvement, or John McCain previously, the guy who had been the fierce independent who suddenly was appealing to the right wing and not uh, being willing to get out of line, that's exactly the wrong kind of candidate. And so I would wish that for the Republicans. Right. So you're thinking of what, Scott Walker of Wisconsin, or who, who sort of fits your definition? Well, I think, again, I'm, I'll stay with Rand Paul just for a moment and say, to the extent that he is, and I'm no expert on Rand Paul, but to the extent that there is a libertarian philosophy that uh, he sticks to regardless of political convenience, I think that makes him a stronger candidate than many. All right, we talked earlier about the crazy uh, media environment that you live in. This is the New York Post. This is a photo of you jaywalking on the front of the Post, playing in traffic. Uh, thank you, Marsha Kramer. And uh, here's uh, your son, Dante's Inferno. You're a parent of two uh, high school, junior, college, sophomore, right? Yes. And what do you do? College, to... wait, high school, senior, college, junior. If I didn't get that right, I'd be in trouble. Thank you. Fact checker. Fact checker. Uh, and uh, what do you do in that environment to protect and encourage your children? It is fascinating, and I'll say it this way. My kids um, were always around this. My daughter helped me run for school board in Brooklyn and was handing out leaflets in front of her school when she was four years old. And so they've come up with it very organically, and it's actually, I think, immunized them very nicely. And so. They appreciate some of the interesting moments. They get what this is all about. And to my, uh, just blessed to have two children who are very conscious of the world around them and care. But they also, in a funny way, just let it wash right over them. So Sherlane and I have been very, very lucky because organically our kids got the armor. And they also think it's laughable. They think a lot of it is laughable. They, they look at this environment and they're kind of, it's a little bit of like, what are you adults thinking? that some of these things could be on the, head, on the front page of a paper. We have a lot of parents here and watching. What do you say to them or what do you tell them to encourage them? Clearly, like, that comes from you. Like, what have you done to get them in that place? I, I'm, this is tremendously traditionalist, you'll forgive me. Um, a loving home, you know, I, and I, this is not a value judgment on anyone. It's a complicated society and, and some marriages don't work and some do work and that's uh, an individual reality. But, We've been blessed to have a very strong, intact, loving marriage and home. And I think that's the ultimate uh, strengthening for life, by definition. And in a way, when some of the silliness occurs around you, it bonds the family together. At one point, famously, my daughter, uh, during one of the stranger controversies when Mayor Bloomberg said that we had uh, created a racist campaign, you might remember this comment at the very end of the primary campaign, apparently seeming to suggest that we were appealing based on our family composition for votes from different backgrounds. My daughter, you know, then uh, 18, couldn't take it any longer and stepped in front of a group of cameras at an event and said, it's not like my, mom, my dad planned 20 years ago to marry a black woman so 20 years later he could put her on display. You know, and, and this was my daughter just speaking. She didn't say, can I say this? She just went out and said it. And uh, there was a, a powerful truth. But part of what I think that is, is part of how kids make it through all this is they, they are themselves. They have to be encouraged to be themselves, to have their own views, to have their own uh, beliefs and to act on it. And our kids felt very comfortable that they too were actors in this world. Now, uh, welcome to your world. There's another New York Post front uh, page. Uh, this is bad old days, yeah. squeegee men are back. They found one yeah, this, and they've used him a couple of times. I like, th the problem here is that plural men, it should have said squeegee man is back until he was arrested later the same day and then he wasn't back anymore. So, <laughs> but he was in the paper again. Yeah, well he had his day. Yeah, the, the squeegee man resurgence that res lasted, lasted about 36 hours and was done, so. Uh, today, this week, uh, you uh, went after the press. To what degree is what the New York Press does fair game, and to what degree do you view it as too much? 
if you're in public life, you're going to be uh, criticized, poked and prodded, investigated. That's all normal. What I think we have to ask is a couple of things. When is it motivated uh, by a desire, uh, a, a desire to either get a story or promote a worldview, which clearly some of the media outlets do, to such an extent that therefore family members, children, in the case that we're talking about here, someone's boyfriend, like anything they do now is also part of the public debate. And I think that is a very slippery slope. I don't think, if you want to find someone's second cousin or their great aunt and see what they did, want, I mean, it's become um, a kind of frenzy that is not only counterproductive, but really is without rules of fairness. And I think it's repulsive to people who look at it and say, this doesn't relate to their lives. And finally, Every time the debate is on personality, or it's about race, or it's about some kind of controversy that is not about people's lives, I think the public asks, why are we not talking about the things that actually affect our lives? Why are we not talking about income inequality, jobs, wages, benefits, housing? Where are the issues that actually are about our lives? So I got a lot of emails from New Yorkers that said you used, or your children were very visible participants in the campaign. Did you open the door? For um, candidates running for office, having their family involved in campaigns goes back generations. Our family is different, and we're very open about that fact, in the sense that we are a very engaged family in political work. My wife comes out of the same work. I met her in City Hall, for God's sakes, in 1991. My kids are very, very politically conscious and active and activist. So we took it upon ourselves. We brought you know, we brought the fire on ourselves, we knew it, we accept it. That doesn't mean every single thing that was done was appropriate, but we at least understood that we were putting ourselves in that milieu. I think that is very, very different than someone you appoint to a job. Does that now mean that every one of us who gets appointed to a job, our boyfriends, girlfriends, aunts, uncles, children, are now also part of the discussion? I don't think that's appropriate. Yeah, so your criticism this week was brought on by the departure of the First Lady's Chief of Staff. Did you defend her too long? No, because the substantive mistakes she made were so minor in the scheme of things. Okay. Parking tickets, et cetera. And she was doing good work. So why is she gone now? Because she decided it was time to attend to family members and family matters. And I think that was the right thing for her to do. All right, a fantastic headline yesterday uh, on the press release for the uh, Quinnipiac poll. It says, New Yorkers are high on pot, not so high on de Blasio. Um, it says that the headline writers enjoyed that one, didn't they? <laughs> it said 71% uh, uh, approve of your decision to criminalize uh, possession of small amounts of marijuana. Overall, you have a 49% uh, percent approval rating. An interesting question in here. Uh, uh, they asked it in a weird way, but their conclusion was that 32% of the people polled thought that Al Sharpton had too much influence on you. Uh, first of all, with all due respect to my friends at Quinnipiac, I think, like many, many polls, I question whether they're getting the totality of the citizenry of our city. And I think this is a subset question that needs to be asked as we move forward. And again, our experience last year, what we found in our campaign, with our message, with our approach to organizing people, and yes, in our own polling, was so consistently different than what the mainstream okay, polls well, were let's showing. Let's just take the issue, not the numbers. How do you deal with the perception or how do you avoid the reality that you're too close to Al Sharpton? First of all, I'm comfortable with the notion, that here's a guy who is, I think, quite arguably the leading civil rights figure in this country right now, and someone who has, in everything he's done publicly, emphasized the need for peaceful protest. And you've seen this consistently in New York and elsewhere. When he's involved, there is a peaceful protest, not a non-peaceful protest. I think I'm very comfortable with the notion of turning to him and asking his advice and treating him as someone who should be in the discussion. But that's it. I'll make my own choices as with anybody else I turn to uh, for advice or for ideas. So I think it's overblown. And again, I often think it's overblown for a purpose. I think there are some voices out there uh, that love to pump up this notion and love the discussion to be about everything but what it should be about, which is economic reality. So he'll remain a friend, advisor? Oh, of course. Absolutely. Uh, Ozzy in Capital New York City Hall Pro this morning, diving into the poll, points out that the racial divide 
uh, in the mayor's base is growing. Black voters approve of your uh, performance 71%, among Hispanics 56%, whites 34%. Why is there that racial divide in your approval? Again, I wanted to say I don't know if those numbers are at all. Well, that's every poll finds that basic. Right, but I'm saying I, I, I would disagree by, I don't think the extent is anything near what's being portrayed here, but put that aside for a moment. If all that is talked about in the public discourse is race, people will think in terms of race. If we talk about economics, people will think in terms of economics. So this is a little bit chicken and egg. Uh, you just held up some lovely headlines. Uh, I think we can safely say that there's a consistency in a lot of the coverage in my fair city uh, that loves to get at issues of conflict, and particularly conflict around race, and that generates a lot of focus and a lot of attention. I think we're missing the point. I think when you shift the discussion elsewhere, and let's talk about fact. Here is not polling, here is fact. I talked about a progressive economic vision. I was in a crowded democratic field. I was way back in the pack. The other candidates were more moderate, et cetera. We won the primary without the need of a runoff. Then I go to a general election. Everyone's voting, independents, Republicans, everyone. I'm proud to say I won with 73% of the vote last year, the largest number for anyone running for an open seat for mayor in the history of the city. Because I talked about economic reality and that transcended a discussion around race or other things that people might be divided by. Now, you go in the long uh, play out of a four year term and again, the conventional media with its obsessions, it's never gonna shock me if you see some of those realities. Right. But when people vote, which is about their own vital interests, those headlines are not what's on their mind. Their job, their pay, their benefits, their ho how much their home costs, how much it costs to get to work, that's what's on their mind. And all those people who are gonna move to Connecticut seem to still be in Manhattan. I think there's a lot of them there. Uh, Ozzy writes, uh, also in City Hall Pro, beginning today, officers will give summonses rather than making an arrest for possessing up to 25 grams of pot. Do you smoke pot? I do not. When was the last time you did? College. Could someone function in your job if they smoked pot? I don't think so. Why not? I think this job is truly 24 seven and you have to be alert at all times. Is that, was that gently said? Now you're a Boston Red Sox fan and yes. one of your theories is that the money ball concept can be applied to government. Yes. Tell us about that. I think it can be applied to government. I think it can be applied to politics because the, first of all, it is about, and by the way, I, I refreshed my memory by watching the movie again Saturday night. I could watch it many, many times and I'd be a very happy person. It's about questioning the, uh, uh, the assumptions that we have all been taught and recognizing how often they are wrong and recognizing that we're in an exceedingly dynamic world. I would argue that the sort of pace of change and consistency of change now is different than probably any time in history, certainly quite different than we, when we all started out. And so, first it is question assumptions. Second it is look at inconvenient data and look at inconvenient uh, indicators. And what we found, I think it's a very powerful uh, parallel last year by uh, saying, for example, we were not going to obsess on who were the funding sources for the campaign or who were the endorsements from mainstream institutions. We are going to actually talk about the ideas and the message that meant something to people's lives. I then fulfilled that prophecy by getting almost no meaningful endorsements. I got no editorial boards. I got obviously a business community that was opposing my campaign. Very few labor endorsements, very few Democratic Party endorsements. If you take the money ball parallel, that would be like, you know, in the past you wanted the big slugger with a lot of home runs uh, and that's where you had to put all your money and time and energy. Well, the big sluggers with the home runs in politics in New York City were supposed to be the editorial board endorsements and big labor and you know, big elements of the business community. We said that's not what matters. What actually matters is does the voter want to show up? So using the on-base percentage parallel, you know, as uh, Billy Bean would say, you, if the, you're going to win a game, you have to score runs. If you're going to score runs, you have to get on base. Well, the same thing here. If you want to win an election, people actually have to show up and vote for you. If they're not motivated to show up and vote for you, we're not in this discussion. So all that wraps around to say that I think what we're trying to do is say, get to the basics of what we came here to do, say it squarely, say it in a definitive manner, and then organize people consistently to act on it. That's the paradigm shift. 
I want to bring you in the, into the conversation so somebody has a question. If you'll just signal, somebody will bring you a microphone. But while we're doing that, a question that came from my colleagues at Politico Pro Education. Uh, recently, uh, Capitol New York reported charter groups prepare to fight state limits, comma, de Blasio. The uh, charter advocates will be going to Albany uh, wanting more charter schools. What are you going to do to fight back against that? I've said that my job is to work with all the children of the city. Um, vast majority of our children go to traditional public schools. But, you know, we have five or six percent of our school system is charters. They matter. Uh, two, I want to serve them. I want to work with them. So that's the big point. We're going to work with everyone. And, and we're trying to fix schools for everyone. That's why we did full day pre-K for all, for example. But I don't think we need to increase the charter cap. And I'm going to do what I would do on any other issue. I'm going to explain why the focus has to be on what we're doing now, fixing the schools, because charters are in large measure uh, addressing a crisis that is a crisis of traditional public education. Why don't we go to the root of the problem and fix traditional public education? So I'll make that case, and that, that's where our energy should go, not in an ever-increasing number of charters. Now, in this uh, capital story by Sally Goldenberg and Eliza Shapiro, they uh, make it clear that there may be a real campaign over this, to what degree will you play defense? Will you raise money? Will there be TV advertisements? It's too soon to tell how all that plays out, but I can certainly say in terms of what we're going to achieve in Albany coming up, it's gonna focus on the same exact things. Uh, our affordable housing plan, uh, we need help from uh, Albany to achieve a plan for 200,000 units of affordable housing. That's enough for half a million people. That is transcendent and necessary for the future of the city. Uh, everything we're trying to do to fix the public schools, we're going to go to Albany with that positive agenda. How we organize and what kind of resources we bring to bear, not determined yet, but there will be a positive agenda we bring forward. And while we're on Albany, you have a agreement, but not a guarantee of future funding for the ramp up of your pre-K program. How worried are you about delivering on that full pledge that Albany won't somehow screw you? I, I think if you had asked me the question a year ago, I would have said, you know, it will all depend on how things have gone on the ground. And now we have some real experience on the ground and the pre-K program has been a real success. I'm very proud of it. And obviously a huge amount of effort uh, went into it to achieve it from so many people in our schools and beyond. So 53,000 kids now getting full day high quality pre-K compared to 20,000 as recently as June when the last school year ended. It's happened, it's a physical reality. People uh, all over the city love it. They love that this is there for their kids. They're looking forward for the next child in their family getting it. I think it would be very hard for Albany to renege on the promise, and it was a five-year promise. So I am hopeful, but we are always careful and vigilant. Uh, if you have a question for the mayor, if you just uh, signal, we'll bring you a microphone. Uh, just go ahead and start and say your name. Uh, thank you, uh, Tom Rising, US News and World Report. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Um, you said it might be necessary for um, Secretary Clinton to run in 2016, but you also say it's important for a politician to take on in income in inequality. And um, you say Senator Warren is saying some great things. You say that Democrats should not, you know, play it safe. They should defy the status quo. Hillary Clinton has a lot of momentum right now, but if Senator Warren is more outspoken about income inequality, would she have a better chance of defying the status quo and winning like you say the Dems should try to? Just a little qualifier. I think some of the you said's were a little, little off base. I'm, I'm not telling anyone whether to run or not. Obviously, I am you know, very, very proud of my history with Secretary Clinton. Um, but again, the decision to run is hers. But I think whoever runs has to address income inequality. They have to do it morally and they have to do it politically. And the absence of doing it will lead to failure. I think it's as simple as that. Um, so to me, uh, the question is not who's going to run, how, when, how many candidates. The question is, how are we going to set this agenda as a party? Now, I'm not saying the formal platform process. None of us would overrate that. How are we as a party going to have the kind of discussion that leads to the reality that the candidate will inevitably address these issues, whoever the candidate is? Um, and I think that the misdiagnosis of what happened in 2014 is dangerous, and that's part of why I wrote the op-ed. If it is, oh, you know, too bad we didn't moderate even more in some of these states, or if it is, it was a tidal wave, 
Well, then I guarantee you a very rough road ahead in 2016. If conversely it is, wait a minute, we didn't speak to the core issue and we didn't speak with passion and definition and a willingness to risk and be bold, then that sets us up for a successful 2016. That's my point. Mr. Mayor, when, pre uh, go ahead, we'll take one more. Mr. Mayor, Matt Ward, I'm with a firm called Sustainable Strategies. Thanks for the great comments. Uh, there's another issue that that some Democrats have arguably run from or tried to avoid. Uh, what do you think the role of climate change, environmental stewardship, and green approaches should be for Democrats? Yeah, I think it's exactly, I appreciate it, because I think it's a, exactly in the core of this same point. The people are figuring this out. And again, I think we sometimes get lost in, in mainstream uh, polling and, and other research, and we're missing something much more essential. The people are seeing extreme weather. People understand that something has changed uh, even from 10 or 20 years ago, and it's a huge danger to themselves. And by the way, what every human being feels who has children or grandchildren, it's an even greater danger to their children or grandchildren. Therefore, if Democrats boldly say, we're gonna take on uh, climate change, we're going to change some of our economic reality to address this, we're going to go after some of the powerful interests that would like to keep our status quo approach. I think they would find not only that the public is with them in an agreement, it would energize the public to align to the Democratic Party and show up and vote. But being, being mealy-mouthed on this issue, which is literally a survival issue, just convinces citizens and voters further that a lot of Democrats don't have any soul and don't have anything to say about their lives. Before we go, uh, we're about to get the hook here. We always do a few uh, lighter personal questions at the end. When President Clinton came to D.C., there was something called Clinton time. And people joked that he never changed his clock after he moved from central time in Arkansas. You two are known as a late bird. Are you saying it's because I had the honor of working for President Clinton once? It's contagious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you make of that, uh, of that issue and your tendency to be tardy? I think, we're, you know, uh, as, as someone once said back in American political history, God's not finished with me yet, and there's more work to do. So I'm going to continue to work on being a better person. But I also think in the end, uh, the question is not uh, a specific event or a specific schedule. The question is, what are we producing? I really believe that, and that's how people are going to judge. You were born in New York, but grew up in Boston, went to high school with Patrick Ewing? Yes, right? I did. How Cambridge, Ringe, and Latin. How, and you have courageously stuck to being a Red Sox. Thank you, Mike. Patriots, Celtics <laughs> fan. That can't have been easy. Did some consultant uh, urge you to sand that down a little bit? Uh, I think a number of consultants and advisors and friends were deeply troubled on this issue. And it, it started very spontaneously. One day I walked into City Hall as a city council member. There was a group of city council members gathered around a New York Times reporter. And everyone seemed to be having a great time. And I innocently walked up. And the reporter said, oh, hi, Bill. We're asking each person which team you like better, Mets or Yankees. Which team do you like? And she did this and put the microphone in my face. And one of those moments where my whole life uh, played before my eyes. And I could either have said, geez, I love those Mets. And I do respect the Mets, but I could have, that would have been the easy out. Uh, or say, I'm not a baseball fan, which would be the biggest lie in history. And the worst possible answer. <laughs> yes. So I decided, let's just do this here. And I said, well, actually, I'm a Red Sox fan. And after that, it just made sense to be who I am. And what's interesting, this is a real uh, extraordinary life uh, experience that verifies everything I've said today. I said it publicly. There was a lot of coverage during the primary campaign. And I can tell you, I can count on this many hands the number of New Yorkers over a year of running for mayor who raised it negatively. And I'm not joking. Because if you actually are who you are, people appreciate it and respect it. Now, uh, one of the great things about being the mayor is you can do what you want, and uh, you uh, took a little field trip to a Pirates Brewers game? I did. You just went to Pittsburgh because you felt like it? Okay, so I'll, say, I'll keep it quick, but I have a real baseball fan, and I am a true fan, knows where the great parks are, and Pittsburgh is supposed to be one of the great, I had heard always, one of the great stadiums. I saw it on TV. I yearned to go there. And one weekend, a few weeks back during the season, Sherlane went out to California to take Kiara back to college. Dante went to a debate tournament. I was suddenly a bachelor for a weekend. And if you're a bachelor for a weekend, where do you go? Pittsburgh. And so, <laughs> and my press secretary, Phil Walzak, is a diehard Brewers fan, because he's from Wisconsin, and I put two and two together that 
the Brewers were playing in Pittsburgh, and let's get in the car and go. And it was a great choice, and it is an extraordinary park for any true baseball fan. Go there, it's beautiful. And, you know, you, you have an experience like that. It takes you outside of all the day-to-day -day madness, and suddenly you're sitting there in Pittsburgh and a whole other reality. It was fantastic. This weekend, Patriots Packers, the number one team against the number three team, a lot of high-level Packers fans at Politico. How worried are you about the powerhouse Packers? I think the Patriots are in the zone right now. I think uh, well, the uh, Patriots are the Packers are in the zone too. Yeah, but I think I, what, blowouts. But the first point I want to say that the the, the news of uh, Tom Brady's demise is greatly exaggerated. You know, earlier in the season, where everyone was ready to have him retire. So I think they actually have that underdog zeal again, even though they're doing well. The original Patriots, we get no respect. Underdog zeal is back. So watch out, Packers. I say. On weekends, you go back to your gym in Park Slope. What's yes. that like? It's great. It's grounding. The same old people are there all the time. And it's my neighborhood. And I think one of the things that's really important to do in public life is stay connected to who you are and where you came from. So that's the neighborhood my children were born in. And that's the neighborhood we had our house, the longest place we've ever lived in our lives. And I want to stay very connected to that because Gracie Mansion is a lovely place. But you can get isolated there. And I think anyone in public life has to spend a lot of time avoiding that isolation. Are you, and you stayed in your Park Slope house for a while, are you, what is the difference in being in Gracie Mansion? Are you starting to feel those effects a little bit? It, you feel them if you stay there. I don't stay there very much, meaning I try to get out to the world. And um, I, I do think it's a, look, I think the notion that someone in public life can get isolated from what people are feeling and experiencing I do small things. I try and take the subway a lot of the time and just engage people in conversation. And again, going back to my neighborhood is very good and natural because all sorts of people come up and talk because they always have with me and you get to get a sense of what's going on. And I think it's really important in public life to come up with your own antidotes, both for keeping your grounding and your sanity, but also to constantly be able to listen unscripted to what people are thinking. It tells you often a lot more than public opinion polls. So at the gym, do people give you your space, or are they New Yorkers? They come up and sound off. What do you think, Mike? <laughs> the latter. <laughs> yeah, there's a, no, I, there's the, my favorite. There are people who are very clear and like give me space, and having security guards there helps. But uh, there's my favorite one is this. You know, I don't want to bother you. You're at the gym. I don't want to bother you. But I got to tell you, what you did last week, and then they go on for the next seven minutes. So it's a classic, you know, it's a classic thing where my fellow New Yorkers have every, I'd say I represent 8.4 million people, every one of whom has a strong opinion, and they cannot hold it back, and I wouldn't want them to. What's your workout routine? Uh, certain amount of cardio, bike usually, weight machines, stretching, nothing too fancy, but it gets me a long way. And how many days a week? I pray that I can get to at least four, so that means also going during the weekdays. And as we say goodbye, you actually buy and listen to possess vinyl. Yes, and Dante does too. Dante, uh, we finally, after moving and everything, I pulled out my record collection. And I have, I will say, I stop everyone dead in their tracks with original Beatles albums. Like I pull out Revolver and Abbey Road and I explain that we would go to the record store when they came out and get it. And that usually gets the attention of even this generation. And uh, Dante started uh, experiencing vinyl, and now he uses it all the time. So there is a power still in vinyl. Uh, we thank our friends at City Hall who made this possible. We thank our colleagues at Capital New York who, uh, for their great coverage. Uh, we thank all of you watching in live stream land. I'm appreciative to my Politico colleagues who put on this amazing event. Thank Bank of America for making this event possible. And Mr. Mayor, thank you for a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Well done.